Now we move to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Xingge Yu. Uh, Xingge was uh, from uh, City University of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, actually, he's uh, pretty busy these days. He not only busy on the target, also busy for collecting the titles. You know, yesterday he was uh, get a award for under 35, uh, you know, by MIT review. So that's a big honor. Uh, Xingge was uh, famous for doing the work for AR and VR, but he's not doing the things by all this handset. He's doing by the skin, in uh, integrated sensors and haptic interface for the VR and AR. That's a new direction. I think this will make eventually a later to come true, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Xingge, stage is yours. Please share your story. Okay, uh, thank did you, you very much. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Zhang. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm Xingge Yu from City University of Hong Kong. And uh, thank Professor Zhang for the um, introduction. So, uh, actually, it's really my honor to be a member uh, in the talk for ICAX because I'm a big fan of ICAX since the first, since, since the first, okay? The first day, the ICAX online. Uh, and actually, I'm also the uh, I, I was a junior uh, lab mate of Professor Zhang. So we all uh, we were all from Professor Zhang Rotter School. So I joined City University of Hong Kong uh, at uh, 2018, and it's uh, about two and a half years uh, of my independent research. And today, I would like to share uh, the our recent research is uh, specifically on the skin integrated sensors and the habitat actuators for VR and AR. Uh, okay, so let's uh, take a look. So regarding to the VR, so whenever when we hear VR, so I think all of us should uh, so imagine this kind of technology. It's a uh, 3D glass. Okay, so we can see the uh, imaging or even movies from the glass and it's a 3D format. Well, some like advanced technology of this kind of VR site, uh, maybe they integrate the, the sound or the system in it. Okay, and uh, not only uh, seeing, uh, watching, but also hearing. And also some other people integrated the like uh, smiling components in it. So that means, so especially when you're playing video game, so when you play video game, uh, so like shooting games, so you can uh, shoot enemy and enemy will shooting you. Then you can also smell something just like in, in the war field. Uh, so all of these efforts, so we can we can uh, know easily is uh, uh, we try to build a realistic uh, scenario to experience the external world. So in a virtual world, so that that is a VR. So actually that is also the concept of VR. So in this case, the question arises, can we build other sensations into the VR system? And then, so it will be a totally new kind of technology. So we know besides uh, uh, watching and hearing, so feel touching is also a very important part in our daily life. So there's a, this kind of movie, I, I bet uh, so some of you should watch this movie before. Uh, this movie was, uh, so first the show in uh, 2018. So name is Ready Player One. So this movie is very interesting. It is described in the future world. So all the people living between the, uh, so the real world and the virtual world. So they are playing video games, everyone playing video games and they can build a character in the video game. So just like this guy. And this character in the, in the uh, so a virtual world, so they can interaction with other people. So like this sense, you see? So it's he or she call, can even feel touching and other communications with other users. So through this advanced VR suit. So we know besides the VR glass, there's another important thing, this VR suit. If you ever watched this movie before, so you should know this suit cost much, much more than the VR glass. So that is uh, advanced uh, equipment. So for advanced players, okay. And this can also uh, technology movie. Uh, so people may question whether this technology can be true. The answer is yes. So if we wanna build such a system, 
So the first thing is that we need to know more about ourselves. So that is a based on the uh, text that feeling. So knowing this information, so we need to know some information about our skin. So knowing which frequency or which force our skin is sensitive to, and, and then so we can uh, build a system more easily. Uh, so uh, taking this uh, for example, uh, so we can see that so all of these parameters, that is uh, that frequency range response to different mechanical receptors under our skin. So uh, the mechanical receptors and our skin from different depths has different sensitive frequencies. So for example, when the frequency is very low, so like a smaller than 40 Hertz, so we typically feel it's a touching. So also when we're shaking hand, you can even feel the heat flow uh, from the each other's hand. And all you can even feel the, uh, the pressure, you can feel flat. That's uh, based on low frequency, okay? And when the frequency increase, so you can feel something different. So this different thing is uh, very interesting. It's very hard to, to describe what this kind of feeling. So, and when this uh, uh, frequency increase to 100 Hertz, for example, 200 Hertz, so you will feel very, very strong vibration. The most obvious example is the uh, smartphone we use. So you can feel the vibration very easily. Uh, for instance, so if you, if you are sitting in a, uh, by a side of a table and assume this table is a super loud and your cell phone is at the other side of the table, if somebody calling you and your, your cell phone is vibrating, you can even feel this vibration. So through this uh, long table. And that's very strange and that's, that's very interesting. The reason is the vibration of our cell phone is set around 200 Hertz. And this frequency is actually the most sensitive frequency to most of us. Even sub several micrometers vibration amplitude, we can even feel uh, this vibration through a, such a long distance. So that's why, uh, so they set the frequency of cell phone at 200 Hertz. So in this case, things seem uh, easier for us. So if we wanna build uh, like a VR system that can give us a, a sensation for textile feeling. So how about we start from the most sensitive frequency that we can do, that is a 200 Hertz. So simply speaking, uh, creating such a VR, uh, so haptic feet uh, interface. So we can just uh, build a system that can work in at a vibration 200 Hertz, okay? So the task is easier, okay? And we are actually not the first uh, group to uh, that's, uh, explore this technology. So a couple of years ago, a lot of scientists has, do, has done some research on, on such an uh, area. And so like uh, this guy, so this is a professor David Eagleman from uh, Stanford University. And now he's also writing a lot of books, the neuroscientist. So several years ago, uh, their group developed such a technology, a WISE, as you can show here. Uh, so this WISE integrates a lot of DC motors. It's just the DC motors, similar like the motor used in the cell phone, but bigger than that, okay? About 10, 20 motors in, in, in the West. And after wiring the West, is uh, some kind of very tight, so perfectly, perfectly uh, fit. And then, so it can covered by other clothes. Okay, so with an additional voice recognition system. So when some people are talking and the system can record the, the voice and then uh, translate these signals to some particular command. And these command through the interface and the electronic components wirelessly or even wired and in, uh, interpret her, and this information and send a command to these uh, vibrators. And these motors will pro provide detailed information and your skin can feel this information and uh, tr uh, transfer the information to the, uh, to the brain and you can know uh, so what the, what's this information mean. Okay, so such systems have a lot of applications. For example, for some disabled people, they may not see uh, or hear. Uh, in this case, they can wear such a suit and use the voice recognition system, translate this information, feel that external word through this voice. So after a long time uh, training, they can know some characters or some words such as uh, hello or goodbye from like a textile feeling. 
okay? Just like a fuse binary. Uh, but we can also uh, find there are uh, some like uh, places that can be further improved, such as such a, a lot of wires, and also this is a battery powered, and also the motor is not uh, contact, very compact with our feet. So there's uh, many things we can do. So we suggest that such a word that calls a skin integrated VR system. And we integrate a lot of mechanical uh, actuators in a small area. So assume we are building a super suit in the movie, uh, the Ready Player One. So we peel off a piece of this suit. So it's a something like this. We can integrate a 32 actuators in a six by six inch uh, so device. And this device you can see is uh, super thick, it's very thick, okay? And this a uh, color layer, uh, this uh, skin color layer is the encapsulation, okay? It's uh, for ethnic. So if we peel off the uh, encapsulation layer, you can see this um, medium, uh, medium um, uh, encapsulation layer and with uh, these uh, mechanical actuators, okay? And you further peel off these encapsulation uh, stuff, you can, you can see the uh, uh, circuits and the electronic component. So in such system, uh, we can integrate a lot of electronics, also including the uh, wireless uh, so a transfer coil and also the power providing coil to some panel, and also including the uh, system on chip SOC, and also capacitor resistor IC whatever so needed for the system. So we'll talk detail later. Well, so now let's take a look at the these uh, uh, actuators. The actuators we so actually we we was. Uh, we were thinking about which technology we, we should use to provide the tactile uh, feedback. So after so carefully consideration, we decided to use the mechanical actuators. So because this one is a more robust and also it's a super fast, okay? And we use this uh, electromagnetic uh, method. That is very simple. Using a very tiny copper wire winded copper coil thrown here and with the, um, so uh, the 3D printing mode to create uh, so PDMS, so ring, and this is a soft ring, and also a tiny magnet with a poly image disc. Uh, so as a supporting layer to hold this magnet. And when we combine them together, it's very small, as you can see here. So the actuators are 18 uh, so millimeters in, in diameters, and the thickness of this one is a 2.5 uh, millimeter. Okay, and so when we input an AC current, AC signal to the coil, assuming we are input a 200 Hertz signal to the coil, and they will create a 200 Hertz alternative magnetic field around this coil, and the magnet will be vibrating, so at this mechanical uh, as magnetic field, and we feel the vibration. So that means this is a vibrator, okay? Uh, so we have a lot of electronics. So for such a system, we integrate about over uh, 700 electronic components. So everything together. So, but, so which each layer, so integration together, so we can make a such complicated system uh, very thin. So like this is a copper based elect, uh, so, uh, electronic so layer and uh, so encapsulation and also substrate. So the total thickness of this device is less than three uh, millimeter. Now we, are, we can further shrink the size and uh, shrink the thickness of this device, okay? And so since this one is a directly contact with our skin, so the stretchability and the flexibility, so it's very important issue. Uh, so then we, uh, so we, we collaborated with uh, uh, Professor Yundang Huang and uh, so, uh, a previous a postdoc, uh, now is a professor Zhao Tianxie, so on the mechanical uh, simulation. So with the advanced 17 design, so we can make, uh, we can make these uh, uh, whole, so, uh, so circuits are very uh, flexible. No matter it's uh, under bending, folding, or even twisting, uh, the string level is less than 3%. So that means the whole system can stand with a uh, complicated, uh, so, uh, mechanical deformations. Well, so we further design uh, the overall dimension of the device. 
The reason is we know so our body is a curve, the time dynamic. So for example, this is the most uh, uh, so obvious example. So we have the different curve on the chest. So we design such a, like a triangle shape. So then it can contact uh, contact with our skin. So since we are using this mechanical uh, actuation vibration, so we don't wanna there's a gap exist. So only so they contact with our skin very tightly. So we can feel these uh, mechanical vibration. And on the back is a butterfly shape and also is a peanut on the arm and also is oval or is a flower shape, whatever shape. So it is, we, we can uh, make it, okay? And it's very flexible, long-term so integrated with the skin. So without the irritation or discomfortable. And then it's, uh, the thing is uh, how we can increase the uh, so efficiency of the actuator. So we know 200 Hertz is uh, uh, so the best frequency and that's our target. And the problem is, so uh, how much power we need to use? So well, 100 milliwatt uh, or one watt. So we of course want the power as small as possible, the power consumption as small as possible. So then, uh, what we did is uh, considered we using the resonance frequency uh, to design such actuator. So resonance frequency, so we are familiar with. For example, uh, so we all know that story. That's uh, uh, so many years ago. There's an army, so they try to cross the bridge, and the general so command all the soldiers to go together, and then so the bridge crashed. That is because the bridge resonance at that resonance frequency. Okay, so that is a, a example that shows the resonance frequency is not good. Well, here the resonance frequency is a good thing. So the reason is, so how about we create a device that's working at a 200 Hertz and the 200 Hertz is also the resonance frequency of the device. That means you can use a very small amount of power to get a very high vibration amplitude. Okay, that's our target. And then, so, we just uh, simply tune, uh, uh, tune the, the, the angle of this cantilever shaped, uh, so holder, PI holder ring, okay? And uh, so by uh, changing the, the, the degree, so the degree, so we can tune the frequency successfully. As we can see that when the degree is a 150 degree, uh, so the resonance frequency is uh, like a 120 or something, 130 Hertz. And uh, when we tune it uh, very precisely, okay, very accurately, so at uh, 168, and we can just uh, tune the frequency at 200 hertz. So it's, uh, it's very perfect. Well, so you can see we can also tune the frequency is about the 200 hertz, okay? So here's uh, around 300 hertz. So what's the reason, okay? So next page, we can show that, okay? So, the application of such an actuator to our skin is to contact them together. Well, so when the uh, magnet vibrates, so every time it's contact with our skin. So even as a freestanding situation is a resonant at 200 Hertz, when it contact with skin, the frequency will be damping down. That means, so the uh, resonant frequency maybe is much lower than that. Okay, so then, we further increase the frequency uh, to uh, 17. So the first standing one is around 280 Hertz. Well, when it's a contact with skin after damping down, so it's uh, just uh, like 200 Hertz. We use uh, such uh, artificial uh, skin and uh, so a contact with the actuator, we use a high speed camera to record the video. You can see here, so we use uh, less than two milliwatts to actuate the device. Okay, you can see every time the contact separation with the artificial skin, even the amplitude is very small. So I can tell you it's very obvious because so 200 Hertz is very sensitive. We are very sensitive to 200 Hertz. Even several micrometers, we can clearly feel that. Well, this amplitude is uh, 30 to 40 micrometer. So that is uh, enough for us to feel this vibration. And if you further increase the input power, so this one can amplitude can further increase. Here I want to mention for the conventional DC motor. So uh, when creating like a 50 micrometer vibration, uh, so amplitude, we probably need a 100 or 200 uh, 
as a millivolt. Well, our device only need so about two millivolt. The reason is that we use a resonant frequency field is a simple structure. Thus, we can make our actuator work very high efficiently. Okay? And when we combine all these high efficient uh, actuators working as a resonant frequency in an array, so that that's very essential because we want to uh, so realize the VR or AR. That means we can't use a single unit. We need to use a large array. So it can create a lot of patterns. So another question arises. If you randomly uh, like arrange, so the, these actuators, it may cause the interferences or we cause the mechanical coupling. So what that means, when we want this one is working, so the neighbor actuators will also like uh, got some influences and uh, you can feel the whole area is uh, vibrating. So this will cause the fidelity of such system will be very poor. So in this case, so we can't call it a successful VR. So how to uh, de uh, decrease or like uh, eliminate these uh, uh, mechanical coupling is very important. So then we started the arrangement. So of these actuators simply by tuning the angle between uh, so the neighbor actuators. So we can see that when the this, this angle alpha at 45 degree, 90 degree, and a 270 degree, the interferences ratio is a less than 6%. You can see that, less than 6%, okay? In this case, we arrange these actuators according to these three parameters so we can make the interferences is uh, very, very small. So when this one is working, the vibration actually is so only like, a, like this local area. So that means, so if you want to touch this area, so this device is only working at that area. It's very precise. And so this <clears throat> is actually the whole design of the device. Uh, and it's uh, all the circuit design and the, the, the schematic design of the device. So how it's working, uh, how, how we, we control it individually. <clears throat> so actually in the, uh, so Epidermal VR device, I didn't mention before is that this one is a totally battery free device. So we use the RF power to provide energy. So why we're doing this is because when we want to create a device and uh, so our super VR field, we're on playing video game. So the batteries, the power consumption is, uh, is very annoying. So you don't want to charge it frequently. And if it's wirelessly with a, like a setup can continuous providing energy, that will be perfect. Then we use the RF power, okay, at a, a 13.56. <clears throat> and so this is a big, big coil. We call this a premium coil. The reason we use a big coil to provide power is these coil can provide a lot of power rather than small small coil. And then <laughs> after regulating these uh, powers, the uh, the voltage and uh, so current will input to each actuators. Well, each actuator was controlled by a system on a chip SOC. We we used a uh, NFC chip. Okay, an NFC chip. Each NFC chip. Uh, has eight general purpose input output uh, ports. So that means each NFC chip can control eight actuators. Uh, so between the actuator and the GPL ports, we have an IC switch as shown here to control the on and off. So that means, <laughs> so these IO port was programmed working at 200 Hertz. So you, you can use the computer interface to control which IO port is on and off. And then, so control the on and off of the switch. And then the current will go through the actuator. The actuator, actuator will on and off. Of course, we can also use the transistors to replace these uh, IC switch. The reason we use IC switch uh, rather than transistor is these IC switch also has a proper regulation function. That means it can guarantee all the actuator working at a so very average level of the power output. So you don't feel one actuator working is very intense and one very weak okay. <laughs> due to the so power regulation function of these IC switch. <clears throat> okay. And so since each IC, uh, so NFC chip can only control eight actuators. If we want to integrate 32 actuators, we need four 
and uh, so NFC chip and also four small antennas. And if you want more, you just simply adding more chips and uh, more antennas in it. Okay. And the question, some people may, may have the question. So in this case, so by finding the address control by each actuator scan, so from the first one to the last one, will take a long time. So then the time delay will be a big problem. Okay, so it's also uh, so make us feel a little bit hard to solve it. We will also talk about how we solve it. Before we're talking about this problem, let's take a look at the power, the power transmission. So the power transmission of the RF, RF technology is, uh, is actually is a big problem, limited by the uh, so working distance. So when you contact the device with the transmission antenna, Close enough, you got a pretty high power. The NFC on our cell phone is an example. So you can read a lot, read a lot of things and uh, so even pay. Uh, so use NS, NFC functions when you contact them together. However, when you separate your cell phone with uh, some reader, so you, you can't connect. So this is a really big problem. That is the reason is, so the magnetic field around the transmission antenna, the bigger antenna, decrease exponentially along the Z direction. Okay, along Z direction. So in this case, so the power, so all gone. So how we maintain the power output? So we introduce uh, even like a bigger antenna than the premier coil, of our device, we call it the intermediate coil. So this coil is just a loop, just it's just a closed loop, which was tuned by capacitor uh, at, 13.56, which is the same as our device. So in this case, this intermediate coil, the bigger coil, can collect magnetic field around it, okay? So in this case, this magnetic field can like a transfer from this transmission tunnel and then to the small device, to our, our VR device in the middle. So then, so we can increase the power output a lot. So here's the comparison, the data with and without the intermediate coil. With, without the intermediate coil, we can see that the black one. So the power output decreased to like, a, like several millivolts when, when the, the distance is 60 centimeter, okay? So when we in, introduce the intermediate coil, so we can make the like a transmission, uh, so uh, still have 50 millivolt input, even if it's 80. Okay, 80 centimeter. <clears throat> and also by tuning the size of this one, we can further increase the working distance. And also, we also introduced the power regulation system to maintain the, uh, so input of the power of the whole system maintained uh, 50 millivolt. The reason of 50 millivolt is uh, each actuator working around is uh, 175 millivolt. We have 32, okay? So when they working together is uh, about this power. <clears throat> That's why we use the power regulator making the working the key. <clears throat> okay, so now <laughs> let's uh, go back to the uh, question. So I, I mentioned before here. So how we, uh, so make sure each actuator, each actuator is, uh, is uh, working um, like uh, individually also without time delay. So this is a big challenge. <clears throat> So if you scan from the first one to the last one, so it will be a very big problem. So assume if you have over hundreds, hundreds of actuators, that means you need to control over hundreds of GPL posts. And after one scan, so the time delay will be a very big problem. So then, so we so suggest the rule is to combine all these uh, uh, NFC chips together. So since we know each NFC can control eight GPL pole. And then, so we use a one bit command uh, to represent the uh, all the GPL poles of the NFC1. So this is NFC1. And this is NFC chip two. And this is a three. And this is four. Assume you have the four times N. So that is the NFC chip four times N. Okay. So if we use a command all zero, that means all these uh, GPL poles are closed. That's a no actuators are working. Okay, if we tune is a zero one zero 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 zero, that means the GPL pulse number one in the first NFC chip is working. 
that means the first actuator is working. Okay. If you tune is a zero one zero one and uh, other is a zero, that means the first actuator of NFC chip one and NFC chip two are working. Okay. And if you tune FF for all these uh, blocks, that means all the actuators are turned off. And we can program these command previously, okay, uh, before we are using the system. So in this case, each pattern will controlled by each command. You uh, uh, so change from one vibration pattern to the other one. So that's you just uh, simply tune the uh, like a pattern. In this case, no time delay. Okay. So here, so that's we we show that is a uh, tune from the GPL post one to two and two, three, two, four. And also we tune for an, uh, to another chip and two and three and four. We can see the time delay between them is very, very small. It's a milli, uh, millisecond level, okay? It's a very, very small. So there, this is very important because if really we can realize the seals like shown in the movie Ready Player One. So if the, uh, so the, the gamer, the, the, the player, so like a few, uh, like uh, the, the character in the game feels some touching. Will the user didn't feel that? After several seconds, feel that. So that's a not good game. Okay? So if it's only 2.3 milliseconds, no one can feel that because our re reaction is, uh, is, is uh, tens and hundreds of uh, milliseconds. So this is short enough for our reaction. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, we don't need to worry about the time delay. Okay, so without time delay, we develop several uh, so software interface. For example, this is a one representative uh, device with eight, eight actuators integrated in a small area. So assume if we wiring this one on a globe and uh, you click, so each so vibration uh, so points and uh, so here this one so can working and you can clearly feel this one. Okay, you can clearly feel this one. Okay, uh, so if there's any uh, uh, like an audience in Hong Kong, so uh, you can feel free to uh, stop by my lab. So there's uh, some demos and you can you can experience it by yourself. And we also have some like a, so, so better so interface, so software interface. Okay. And also, but when we submit in the paper, when we submit in the paper, there's a, so one problem. So it's a reviewer challenge. So the vibration, so we know it's a vibrating. However, the vibration is only like a tenth of the micrometer level. So we can't see it by our physical eyes, okay? So we can't see it. So in this case, how we prove our device is working, we build a such a very complicated system using the laser reflection. So each laser uh, point on these uh, so actuator and with a reflection disc, and it will be projected on a projector. Each laser point represents uh, uh, each pixel. Using the optical leverage, laser liber leverage. So when it's uh, working at a tenth of uh, micrometer vibration, so the amplitude on the projector may be several centimeter like shown here. Then when we, when we control each uh, actuator on and off, we can clearly see that. Okay, here's another software we build. So we can see that we uh, can tap each uh, so pixel you can see here it's uh, vibrating and uh, there's uh, some difference of the amplitude that is uh, due to the alignments difference and also the angle difference but anyway so you can see so it's uh, like uh, working perfectly okay and so another thing is uh, uh, these actuators so can uh, like uh, change from one pattern to the other one without time delay and uh, you can see we can write letters on it and uh, so after writing NU, we also write a CDU, City University of Hong Kong. You can see clearly, okay. Okay, so once we 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 can realize that, so it's uh, things is easier to show some demo. The first demo is very easy to understand. So it's a video game. So like a gamer wearing this device on, on so every part of the body, control a character in the game, so when the, the character in the game was punched or punching the enemy, so you can feel the vibration of the strap, okay? And uh, the other thing is uh, social media. So we know, so especially this year, due to the pandem pandemic or the coronavirus, a lot of so 
uh, people cannot see each other. So like uh, the family and the friends. So how about we create a such system? And if we wire on it, when we do the video chat, you can just uh, touch on the screen. And the user who wear the device can feel the touching. So this is uh, for social media. So which is a similar like the, the movie show in the Ready Player One, like showing in this demo. And also we can also use this one for the, uh, the uh, like a human machine interface, all the prosthetic control and sensing. So this is our volunteer. And so you can see that it's an amputee. Okay, so it's a, a right arm am amputee person. And with a robotic hand, he can uh, grab something. However, so when this uh, robotic hand grabs something, he cannot get the feeling, cannot get the textile feeling. Well, so when we uh, so combine the VR device on the end of the amputee arm, so when uh, he grabs something, the sensor on the uh, so uh, so prosthetic arm can transmit the information to the computer, and then the computer can give feedback to these uh, actuators, and can, he can feel feeling. For example, here when he touch like a cell phone. And uh, there is uh, some pattern vibrating and I know it's a rectangle one. And this is a thick one for the pen. Okay, and so here's a demo. And uh, he can also, through the amplitude of the feedback, uh, can uh, control the force of the grabbing, not grab very hard, okay? <clears throat> and also, so here's actually all these actuator part. So another thing I think is very also, also very important is the sensor. Okay, how about the sensors on this robotic hand on our, on our body? So we also did some work on the sensor for this uh, VR or AR uh, system. So we know for the like textile sensor, we can consider to use the piezo resistive type, capacitive type, and a piezo electric type. Well, the piezo electric type is a self-powered one. It's maybe easier for us to, to like uh, to build the final device, okay? So then we did some work based on the piezoelectric, uh, so based uh, sensitive uh, so sensors. Uh, so since the uh, rigid piezo like a uh, uh, material so like PZT is very hard to fabricate. So then, so we use a PZT powder combined with some PDMS, so very simple. We're using the large area fabrication method screen printing. We can easily make uh, made a bench of device. So like uh, in a couple of minutes, very quick. And using these like a uh, sensor, since all of these materials are intrinsically stretchable, except the metallic uh, interconnect, but there is some um, uh, so mechanical design, it can stand for a lot of mechanical deformations. And also we use the implant design for these uh, sensors. Then even very small pressure, it can uh, create a, a large deformation between each electrode, then we can got a so very sensitive uh, so voltage output. And we can see it's uh, basically in a, a linear relation, so with different uh, stress. And also, so each cycle is very, very uh, uniform and it can work in for a long term. So even after like a thousand cycles, it's still very stable. And with a such system, and we can uh, so combine with the like a robotic hand. So for example, we can use a glove with a lot of sensor mount on it. And after recognizing each uh, so gesture, so and we can uh, perfectly perfectly copy this uh, action to a robotic hand, like shown here, without time delay. And of course, all all of these can be integrated is uh, like a, on a very small system. And also due to we are using the screen printing, the fabrication method is very easy. So we can make a large array, uh, like in, in also a couple of minutes. And in this case, we can uh, so realize the e skin for like a textile mapping like shown here. And also, so considering we are using this kind of rubber so uh, based uh, system, we can also consider to uh, so harvest energy from the piezoelectric based material. Well, the problem is the uh, internal resistance impedance is uh, super high since there is a, a PDMS in it. To decrease the resistance, we can consider to add some conductive materials like a graphene, for example. So not changing the mechanical performance, but also in, in improve the internal so impedance, so conductivity. In this case, so the voltage wasn't increased uh, very much. Well, the current can increase a lot. 
So compared to the pure, so PZT and PDMS blend, and it's also very sensitive. And we can use uh, several like uh, advanced designs, such as a monolithic drone with a, a center empty structure. And when we bending our uh, legs, it can generate a lot of power for voltage here. So the current is uh, in uh, micro amperes level. So compared to the previous, we mentioned the pure PMS uh, and the PZT blend. So the current improved 100 times, okay? And also, so since we already working on the self-powered technology, <clears throat> so I think a lot of people are familiar with the triple electric, especially the triple electric nano generators. It can be used as a screen sensor, self-powered screen sensor also. Okay, and as a working principle, not as so, uh, so like uh, talking in detail due to time limitation uh, here. So it's a, uh, basically based on contact separation, triple electrification. Well, so the problem is, uh, can we combine this technology with the epidermal electronics technology to create a, like a new type of sensor we call the epidermal TNGs, okay? And then for new type of cell power epidermal sensors. And uh, we did some job to uh, so, uh, so conquer the mechanical mismatch between the triple electric materials and the structures and in our skin. Well, so the first work is, uh, we try to uh, like uh, find the best ratio and the design, mechanics design for such a uh, epidermal based, uh, so TNG. So we know, so the larger the area of the contact electrode in TNG, so you actually get a better, uh, so contact area and a better output. Well, for realizing stretchable electronics, we need some structural design. So that means, so in a certain area, so for flexible electronics, the middle coverage area is very limited. So in this case, we need to find a balance between the metal average coverage ratio and also the performance. Then we did this is a mechanics design uh, and an area to metal coverage ratio uh, with the performance and to see which is the best uh, so parameter. And uh, so the whole design is also flexible. That's uh, so that's our strong, uh, strong points. Um, and after a lot of comparison, we found that, uh, so when it's around 60, 50, 60% 60 of coverage, we can got a uh, so pretty good stretchability and also the stable, so output, even it's under stretched. So you can see the uh, voltage output is so very stable. And so for this one, it can like up to 30%. So it still can maintain 70, uh, 80% of the voltage output. And also, uh, so here is a detail, and uh, and also for this one, uh, this small device can generate uh, so like a 40, 50 uh, so volts, and uh, it can be used uh, for like, uh, uh, so sensing also. And uh, I think I need to speed up, <laughs> okay? And also we can also use the uh, Allen Bridge structure to realize su such a ETNG. And also, so this is a uh, so very high efficiency. Uh, and so this is another kind of island bridge, but we also increase some metal structure in it. So we call it a, trampol uh, tr a trampoline inspired, so can increase the stretchability in the Z direction. Uh, okay, and uh, let's skip it. So, and for this one, the stretchability is even better. Uh, so it can up to 40%. So it can maintain so good performance and also can be used for e-ski. And also we can uh, use some like a uh, intrinsically stretchable, like a spongy or like foam base for these uh, sensing or energy harvesting. Okay. Uh, so uh, today, so I basically talk on the uh, sensor and actuator used for the, um, uh, so VR, AR. So we actually also working on the materials and also the other type of biomedical sensors and here are our recent publications. And uh, I reserve this for future ITX talks. So if Professor Zhang invite me again. Okay. And uh, so here as a summary, so we start from the sensor uh, and uh, then integrate the electronics to the system level VR, VR and AR. In the future, I believe, so there's a lot of areas we can do. So in this uh, whole field. And so as an acknowledgement, so, uh, some of the work are done uh, so during my uh, postdoc at Professor John Rogers Group and the collaborators uh, 
so from so different universities and my group members, uh, postdoc and PhD students, uh, they did a really great job. And uh, so this is my group website. And thank you very much. A great, Xinge. Yeah, really good, wonderful talk. I think I definitely will invite you come, uh, come back again. Yeah. So yeah, now it's a question part. Uh, there were several questions. This question, first one is for amazing talk. Thanks for the skin integrated VR system and based on vibration frequency. How to calibrate uh, in the different people? Oh, wait a second. Okay. Can you see this? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's a yeah. So on my, on my laptop. Uh, skin there is a. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is, this is actually this is a really great uh question. Uh, so different people, so they have different uh so feelings. So this is a very like an obvious question. So when we use electrical textile, uh, so actuation technology. That's why we use the mechanical vibration technology. If we use the mechanical vibration uh, technology, so we did a uh, so research on many people around us, and I can tell you, so most of people, so uh, so over ninety nine percent people are sensitive to two hundred hertz, and they all feel it's uh, like a similar feeling, like a that range. So in this case, we didn't, uh, we we haven't done detailed calibration, but. So we know, so a lot of people so are pretty similar. So due to this kind of vibration. Okay, that's very good. That means we are all human beings. Yeah, <laughs> maybe like other animals, they will have different feelings, right? For different frequency. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, is from uh, maybe a Chinese uh, medicine uh, doctor. Now, congratulations for your wonderful talk. I'm not sure when you study this skin-based VR system, did you think about uh, uh, acupuncture point xue wei, uh, in traditional Chinese medicine or not for transfer the vibrations through the nerve system to the brain? Okay, is this can be answered? Uh, so this quest question is also is a very inspiring. It's a very creative question. So yeah, so I I uh, so I think it's uh, maybe we need to use a little bit different uh, kind of technology. Maybe use a air pump something. So since this one the vibration the vibration is uh, still very small, so you can feel that even is uh, on on the like a shui wei. So we talked about. So mm. I, I think we can't feel obvious difference. But it's worth to try. I, I would say it's worth to try. Okay, yeah, I think, you know, in Chinese medicine, there are a lot of kind of things you need to investigate. Yeah, uh, you never know, you know, what kind of physics or science behind, but uh, yeah, try your wonderful, you know, technology, maybe you can tell us the behind the story. Uh, okay. Yeah, next, next question is about for different application, how you define the resolution of the array? Uh, so I guess in this case, uh, so I'm not sure if you're talking about the sensors or actuators. So then I put on the both question. So mm -hmm. if, uh, so we're talking about actuators. So define the resolution of the array it actually is not that difficult. So we actually don't need to realize a super high resolution of the textile feedback because our bodies are not that strong. So even you have a 100 by 100 in a very small area, you can't feel the resolution. So, mm -hmm. so you can do a simple experiment. So by touching something, so the re resolution of our hand is the most sensitive part. And mm -hmm. so like, I think it's a in millimeter scale. So in this case, it's not hard to realize. So then, so this uh, millimeter is the like a uh, so standard for us to define the resolution. Well, if we are talking about the sensor part, so for uh, talking about the sensor part, it's uh, totally depending on different type of application for textile feeling or like a uh, human machine interface. So I think we need to uh, like a uh, follow up with the uh, feedback. So how many actuators we need, then we define how many sensors. Well, if we are talking about on some like a neural interface, uh, so like the neural link, so Elon Musk or some other like a, a neural interface works done by other groups. So we need a super high resolution. 
as many as the pixels we can. Then we can collect uh, enough information and uh, then know these uh, neural activities. Okay, yeah, that's a big job because many, many more pixels come in, you know, more complicated for the circuit. Uh, yeah, for the big data, for the calculations, all these jobs, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, it's wonderful, yeah, for you show us the demo for the VR system based on skin. So uh, as I can ask, you know, we have this tradition, we deliver the certification to all the speakers. Thank you, Xinge, for your wonderful talk. Uh, connect the world and the universe by your technology. It's yours. I will deliver to you the hard copy maybe next time I met you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Zhang. Okay, now we move to the panel discussion part. I hope everyone was here. Please turn on your camera. And uh, yeah, this was the most popular part. Yeah, so uh, uh, Sheng Xin, yeah, Xinge, and Xu Yang. Uh, Xu Yang, you can uh, turn on your microphone now. Yeah, I think everyone. Uh, okay, there are a lot of questions that just now don't have time to answer. Now, yeah, maybe we came to the first question is from the audience. Yeah, the audience asked, uh, you know, for Sheng Xin, and uh, I think also for all of you is, uh, yeah, how do you choose a topic? Uh, you know, yeah, why you choose this research topic? You know, all this uh, fantastic topic, how you found it and how you choose it. Okay, maybe we're from machine, you go the first. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure who asked the, 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 the question. <laughs> Is a student or a faculty? Yeah, Maybe I can share the yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. I know, uh, the, for, for students, uh, based on my experience uh, as a graduate student or a postdoc, researcher probably you don't have too much choice you have to do whatever your, your advisor tells you to do right because uh, in, in the early stage for academia life uh, as students you 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 probably don't have uh, uh, so much so many experiences to determine the importance of the, of the, the topic and the, which direction should you go and also it's, it's highly dependent on the the funding situation of the research group right so as a student, it's, uh, you you probably have to follow your advisor's suggestion to to do research. As for me, it's the same. You know, my uh, I my background is basically about the semiconductor devices, photonic device. So you do solar cells, photo detectors, LEDs, uh, things like that. Okay. So I I get my most of my graduate student PhD training and postdoc training uh, based on that. So. Uh, about the semiconductors and optical electronics. And in the last year of my postdoc research, postdoc research, I think it, it was about five or six years ago. And at that time, uh, uh, my advisor, Professor John Rogers, uh, he, he happened to have a, a project about the uh, optical sensing inside the brain. And uh, he, he just said, well, you, you are working on the photo detectors and the solar cells for so many years, right? And you, you can make a, such a good uh, photo detector and high efficiency, uh, highly efficient photo detector. Can we just use that to detect the optical signals inside the brain? Mm -hmm. And then in, at that time, I started to, to go into the, the, the biomedical field and start the brain research. And we, 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 we gradually use our uh, optoelectronic devices to to interact with the, the the neuroscience, right? To use that to sense light, detect light, and deliver light into the the brain tissue. And uh, when I started my independent uh, research research uh, research in at the Tsinghua University, and I I switched uh, my direction to to this area right? and try to uh, implement all the uh, techniques and the and the expertise I, I gained in the optoelectronic field and use those uh, uh, advanced uh, photonic devices I developed. And I don't just uh, go to the bio biological science directly, right? I still focus on the device side in the first uh, uh, few years and uh, develop the high quality device. Not only high performance, high efficiency, but also they have to be uh, biocompatible. They have to be small enough, thin enough, and uh, stable enough to operate it 
in the in the brain, right? So we did a lot of engineering work on this aspect, and then use that to to detect the brain signal. And then then I learned more and more about the 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 brain science and the neuro engineering, right? And I found this is a very interesting topic. There are a lot of things we can do as an electrical engineer. So I get uh, more and more interested. And uh, of course, we'll find more and more interesting direction to go in this area. That's basically my Yeah, so Xin, thank you for hearing us. Yeah, so Xin Ge, can you tell us something about uh, your story to choose a topic? So fun, so cool. Uh, OK, yeah, yeah. So I think Professor Sheng is uh, basically uh, so provide a suggestion to like students. Uh, and so I would like to talk about uh, the all share some experience to like uh, some uh, some people who just uh, started their career or would like to start their career in, in the next couple of years. So first the thing is that uh, depending on the resources you have, so that's uh, similar to our life. So if you only have 10 bucks, so for, for a whole day's living expense, so what you will choose for your food. So of course, something can feed yourself make you feel full. And uh, if you have a lot of money, so that's, uh, you can do whatever you want. So in this case, so uh, so if we only have very, very small amount of funding, so I, I suggest to do something is uh, uh, solve some uh, science scientific problem. It's a ba basically some like a, a, like a more fundamental studies. So in this case, uh, so I, I don't think it's, uh, so that's a hard than the like a complicated engineering because according to my experience, so engineering work is really time consuming and also need a lot of things, need a lot of resources. Well, so if we only consider, so ideally consider, so which direction is the good direction. So assume we, we have a lot of funding, a lot of resources. So uh, that is uh, uh, based on the uh, really, uh, so needs from like uh, the, the society and uh, from the like uh, other people. So solve some problem, uh, so which that is a uh, bottleneck or which I haven't been solved for many years or it's uh, something uh, people never thought before. So the easy, I think the, the easiest way to start is uh, combine two area together. So two area mm -hmm. A and area B. It's a not not randomly select them, so they must have some connection. So, like uh, you know something about the direction A and the direction B, and uh, maybe when you combine them, it's not A plus B. Maybe maybe a completely direction C. It's something like a uh, so Professor Sheng's ex experience. So when you uh, have a lot of experience, I think you should have uh, some idea what you want to do. So I also have some experience of changing uh, so research area, area so uh, frequently. So my uh, bachelor degree is optical engineering. And mm -hmm. so my master is working on organic electronics. And my <laughs> PhD is working on some uh, material synthesis on the metal oxide, low temperature solution process. Okay. Well, when I joined the Professor John Rogers group, start from the like a fabrication and a engineering on some, some piezoelectric materials for uh, biomedical sensing. And then it's uh, like, a, uh, so skin electron, skin integrated electronics for like a habitat feedback. And now I'm also working on some like uh, sensors. Uh, so, but I have experience of uh, materials and also physics, uh, semiconducting physics and also optics. So now I, I feel it's a really a good experience for me to have a, a lot of directions, uh, research areas before. So that's my suggestion. <laughs> okay, that's very interesting. Here are some of the students asking questions for the details of your process. I think they can go ahead and read your, you know, uh, articles, your publications. There are many, many. Xinger's publication was really a lot. So please go through that. There are a lot of information there. Okay. Yeah, Xi Yang, I just heard two of the, uh, you know, Xinger and the Xing's story. Can you tell us your story for choosing this emerging technology? Um, I think the other two speakers have covered a lot. Um, so I just have a couple of more uh, points that I want to add on. Um, so one thing I think is very important is to uh, define your own research uh, profile. 
uh, which is even more critical for uh, people who are in the career transition stage. Either you are a postdoc who's looking for a future academic position, or you are a uh, newly independent PI. I think um, it is extremely important for you to have your own distinguished um, research uh, features that could easily um, differentiate your research uh, from your department or even your area. Um, another thing I would like to add is uh, think about uh, collaborations. Um, compared to the other speakers, my career research develop, uh, development hasn't been very uh, disciplinary uh, as I started from uh, lithium ion batteries and uh, gradually moved on to uh, sodium and the potassium ion batteries. But overall, I've been working in this area for uh, quite uh, quite a long time. So uh, I got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, background in this area. But what I found once I started my own independent career is that um, you need to think not only what you can do, but also what you can do with other uh, researchers in the area, which would definitely widen up your uh, view. So I have learned quite a lot through this year and a half time at UCL that I haven't realized a couple of years ago. And I think you should be able to identify uh, topics and areas within your expertise that you could collaborate with uh, people all over the world. And I think your co collaborators usually uh, would bring new things you don't know about, would help you, would uh, keep widen widening up your view on this topic. So that's the two things I would like to add on. Yeah. Uh, very, very good. Actually, Young, uh, we know that uh, you have got PhD in uh, uh, China, right? Yeah. Yeah. As the yeah, as USTC. Then you go overseas, you know, for pasta. Then you get a job in, you know, London. So that's quite a long journey, right? Do you say that's a collaboration with different peoples and uh, you need open mind to everything, right? Yeah. I think for uh, many audience here, they are um maybe PhD students or graduate students or they want you know go something or they want uh found a job in academia. So I think your experience will be very helpful for all these students. Yeah. If you can, you know, give their one or two suggestions of how they can prepare the during the postdoc. Yeah. So uh, uh, before they came to independent, that would be more uh you know, valuable for all these students. Yeah, please, uh, if you can, you know, uh, find a few comments here, that's better. Share. Sure, sure. I would like to share some of my experiences with um, PhD students and uh, uh, especially senior year PhD students <laughs> and postdocs. Yeah, um, so uh, as I mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago to uh, specifically, um, present yourself uh, with your strength and expertise and very much uh, address how your uh, expertise and the background can contribute to uh, the group you're applying for. Uh, from the perspective of, of the PI, what I'm, looking, what I'm looking for from applicants is not only uh, the, the, the background that fits my research area, but more importantly, I would like to see what's new this person can bring into my group, even mm -hmm. things I don't know about. So I think uh, most of the time, if you could uh, present yourself, address your expertise in a way that could uh, complementary the, the group that you're applying for and bring new uh, insights and the knowledge into the group, I would think that you, you have a very good chance to get this position. Okay, very good. I hope all of them got good chances. So, uh, Shinke, back to you. So, you got a good chance to find a good job, you know. Yeah, you collaborate with your colleagues. So, uh, can you say a few words to the, you know, uh, postdocs or PhD students here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 
regarding to this topic, so I would like to like uh, say something that is not by me. It's uh, by like uh, another professor. It's another uh, famous professor. It's a prestigious professor. He, he told me before. It's a uh, uh, when he uh, hires postdoc, he's trying to open a new area mm -hmm. because the postdoc that means he try to hire a person who complete uh, do a completely different topic, and mm -hmm. when he hiring uh, a PhD students, he's uh, like a uh, trying to like a uh, realize something that haven't finished by the previous members. Mm -hmm. In this case, I uh, inspired me a lot, so. That means it's a very creative. So even it's uh, after uh, it's uh, already so very famous, and uh, so he's still trying to create uh, some new things. And uh, for so in this case, I think for uh, for like a PhD students, it's uh, very important. It's very important to dig deeper. So that's also my experience. For PhD students, uh, it's uh, maybe not a good thing to like uh, focusing on like uh, many many projects. And I, I mentioned actually you can change project, uh, but during one period, maybe during PhD, so like a digger deeper. So you can just focus on, focus on, on one area and uh, so doing more research on it, knowing more materials and uh, become an expert after you graduate. And in this case, no matter if so you wanna keep doing further works on this area, so I think you are already an expert, that will be no problem. Or even you wanna change uh, area. So there will be a lot of opportunities in front of you. Okay. And when, so you are like a, in, in a, a middle career, so during the early career, so that means for, for a postdoc, we will try to like a facing funding a position. Uh, so in this case, um, so I, I think so it's uh, like not only focusing on do your own work, it's also it's a besides uh, so working, besides working, also thinking. So thinking for the future, uh, thinking for the big picture. So then, uh, so you will know, so the meaning what you are doing and uh, your target will be more clear. So I think that's my, uh, my comment. Okay, very, very nice. So, Shengxing, yeah, you may have more to share with all this audience. Yeah. Oh, okay, I think uh, uh, the previous two speakers have shared very good uh, insights about this point, right? So I just want to add a few more points. Uh, from a graduate student to postdoc researchers to the young faculty members in this procedure, right? You'll get more and more freedom yeah. you become more and more independent yeah. so which means gradually uh, as a young researcher right at uh, no matter which state are you in you have this gradually think that uh, how can you manage the research the entire research by yourself mm -hmm. right uh, uh, not only is the, you when you start your uh, graduate students research right so the advisor will teach you a lot of things and the senior group members they will teach you all the ex experiments and the skills but gradually you have to learn by yourself i think and you learn a lot you learn how to do experiments then you learn uh, how to uh, collect the results right how to analyze the data and how to write a paper and then you have to learn how to initiate uh, uh, research right how to initiate the project how to secure funding and mm -hmm. how to uh how to supervise other people right <laughs> and so this is a, a procedure you have to get more and more uh independent and and uh, right so in this procedure mm. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this work is very important to all these students online and all these young scientists online. I see that you have to think about that. You must be independent. Yeah, as soon as possible. Even you are PhD students, you need to try something, you know. Yeah, get done by yourself and uh, get more skillful and get more mature. If you go to postdoc, you have to have your own ideas. You try to, you know, persuade your supervisor, you know, maybe go to some new directions. That's more helpful, you know, for the uh, people who can grow up. 
I think many students, especially in mainland China, most of students are waiting for the supervisor to give them, you know, questions and, uh, you know, to give them some directions. Uh, not waiting for that. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, go ahead aggressively, you know, to try to find yourself. You will find that as soon as possible when you are young, then you grow up very fast. I think that's the way you see all these young scientists, they grow up very fast because they training themselves to be independent. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the last few minutes, I try to give everyone a second to say that what kind of student you want to have. Yeah, because now is application time. Yeah, okay. So you already have the slides, but your emphasis, you know, one or two sentences for the students, yeah you want to have oh yeah for students and the postdocs we always welcome uh, okay. the young scientists to join us right and uh, we hope you can be a future scientist by yourself so you you have to be self-motivated and uh, eager to learn and uh, like to collaborate and uh, learn from other people okay so that's Very the, good. That's the people yeah. who is uh, eager to learn new things to, to take challenges, go to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hinge, yeah. Did you need a new students? Have openings? <laughs> yeah, so, so our life is always well, is welcoming. So like a, a graduate students and a postdoc. So I still, so I prefer the ambitious students. Uh, so one example, so one of my students, uh, so the first time, uh, so uh, meeting with me, and uh, he told me he want to be a faculty, faculty member, and uh, in a very top university. <laughs> and okay, now really doing a good job. He's really do, doing a really good job. And uh, so ambitious uh, students, so always self-motivated. So, and so then, so this is a, uh, something that's uh, like I think students need to need to learn. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, try to be ambitious and to achieve high. Yeah, that's more important. Okay, Shia. Um, for PhD students and postdocs, what I would like to see is uh, the demonstration of the ability to formulate research ideas as you apply for this position, you would usually uh, require, you would usually be required to write uh, proposals or even a research description. So that's the evidence to show you have the ability to initiate uh, new ideas. And I, I think that's the most thing I'm looking at at the moment. Okay, very, very good. Uh, thank you all of you, time fly. Yeah, we yeah, uh, will close the panel discussions. We move to the last lecture.